okay. Um, would someone like to open us in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for this um, beautiful day you've blessed us with. And, um, and Lord, as we have come together to um, learn more, to um, grow in our knowledge, and also to increase our understanding, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Holy Spirit, and that um, and that uh, you would help um, Smith Imam to teach us well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so yesterday we um, just started to look at the first Great Awakening. We looked a little bit at some of the missionary societies uh, that had been formed to uh, encourage people into missions, to support uh, missionaries that were being sent out. Uh, we looked at uh, the start of the Quaker movement. So that was where they were experiencing uh, the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, they were seeing manifestations of the Holy Spirit in their meetings. And so that's why they started being called the Quakers. Um, and um, some missions work that started with uh, the Native Americans um, and also the King James Version that was released and uh, became uh, the standard English Bible for um, over 300 years. So we'll continue from there. Uh, let me just share screen. And... Okay, so uh, we're looking at uh, what's known as the Moravian Revival. We'll be looking at it more in detail than is in the textbook uh, in this chapter. There is more detail in your next chapter, but we'll cover it here and then the next chapter we can just, we won't do it so much in detail. Uh, so in 1727, so this is after the First Great Awakening, um, in Germany, there was a group of people called the Moravians. Now, the Moravians uh, dated back to someone named John Huss that we talked about. I don't know if you remember his name, but he is from, if you have, if you're looking at the presentation, he is from this place called Bohemia. Uh, so he was from Bohemia and he was 100 years before Luther started to talk about the authority of scripture uh, and started to talk about salvation through grace alone. So uh, even before the Reformation, he was talking about the things that the Reformation would uh, would kind of highlight as issues in the church. Um, so these people came out of John Huss's leadership, the Moravians, and um, they were kind of, they were followers who continued to uh, practice some of the things that he had taught. Um, but because of persecution, so Moravia is right next to Bohemia, if you can see it on the map. Um, because of persecution in Moravia, they moved out into um, Germany to escape persecution from the church. And um, it was during this time when they moved to Germany that they met someone named uh, Count Zinzendorf. Now, Count Zinzendorf was uh, the son of a couple who was who were part of the Pietist movement. Uh, the Pietist movement was in Germany. Uh, and so they were also a breakaway from the church. So uh, they were calling people to experience a personal faith in Christ, to experience personal transformation and uh, a change in the person's heart rather than just theology and rational thinking about the Christian faith. Uh, so uh, they were 
not part of the mainline churches at that time. Um, and so Zinzendorf was a son of these pietist uh, a couple. And he grew up with the faith, uh, knowing faith right from his childhood. So in his own um, accounting of his personal spiritual journey, he said he'd always known God. So there was never any like one moment that he could point to in his life where he had a conversion experience. Um, because for him, his whole life, he had walked with God. He had known God right from his childhood. Uh, so Zinzendorf met uh, the Moravians in Germany, and he invites them to come and live with him on a property that he owns. And so the Hernhut community is established here. Uh, so they function under his leadership, and he kind of oversees them. He brings unity among them because they're all from different places, and there are disputes that arise. Uh, he's kind of guiding this community uh, and helping them grow spiritually. Uh, so during this time, um, there was a prayer movement that started among them. Uh, and they started to do, in one of their meetings, the Holy Spirit uh, just moved in power. And from that time, they started these prayers in one hour rotations. So two to three of them, there were about, um, I think, 24 men, 24 women. Uh, and they started to meet in groups of two to three uh, for one hour a day. And in rotations, they would be praying basically 24 hours a day. Uh, and that movement continued for a hundred years of praying 24 hours a day um, in these groups like that. So that obviously made a huge, huge impact on that community. Lots of missionaries were sent out uh, from them. And just in a few years, they sent out more missionaries than the whole Protestant church had sent out uh, for the two centuries, 200 years before that the Protestant Reformation started. Uh, they sent out more missionaries than all the missionaries that had gone out in those 200 years. Uh, so there's a map here of all the places that they sent missionaries to. Um, so this is just uh, the power of prayer, right? Uh, praying for 100 years will definitely have an impact. Uh, and so uh, they set up these missionary stations all over the globe, right? You can see Europe, you can see uh, India, there's Bengal there, there's uh, Sri Lanka, um, South Africa, uh, North Africa, East Africa, South America, North America, uh, Greenland, so all over, basically. Um, so this is one church that had a huge impact, and that's why we're going to look at it again in the next chapter. Um, so after this, we have, uh, in 1738, uh, the Methodist revival. So we won't cover that, because Anand uh, talked about John Wesley and um, his contribution. Uh, but one thing uh, to note is that John Wesley was actually impacted by the Moravians. And so, uh, we can attribute this work of what he was able to do to that, uh, to how he was influenced. He was on a mission journey to North America uh, to work with the Native Americans. Uh, and on his trip to uh, North America, he met some Moravians on a boat. And uh, as he was talking to them, they asked him about his faith. They said, uh, they kind of asked him about his personal faith. He was already a preacher. He was already going out and telling people about Jesus. But they asked him, uh, what about for you? Do you personally believe? Because that was their main thing, no? Was the, uh, how is your heart being transformed by your faith rather than just an intellectual knowledge of your faith? Um, and for John Wesley, this was a new kind of way to think about it. He always knew in his head that uh, uh, Jesus has saved uh, all people. But the question was, do you believe he saved you? And um, so that really impacted him. It was a question that left him thinking. At that time, he said, yes, I believe. But later on, as he writes in his journal, he says he, it, wasn't, it wasn't a full like a faith, an affirmation of, yes, I I know for sure that I am saved by Jesus. And it was a later experience that he had with uh, where the Holy Spirit moved in his heart and gave him that affirmation. 
uh, that he could then say, now I know for sure uh, that I'm saved. So um, not only did the Moravians do work that was impactful themselves, but they also impacted people who would then go and change the world, who would then go and make a huge impact on the church. Um, so 1741 to 1744, uh, there was a revival in Scotland um, through a pastor named William McCullough. So he was pastoring a small church, uh, and the town was also a really small town, only about 4,000 people in that town. Uh, he was not known to be a great preacher. His own son uh, talked about the fact that people were not, he was not a very powerful preacher. Uh, but he had the role of a pastor. His nickname was Yil or Ale Minister because whenever he preached, people would start to get up to go and drink water because they couldn't sit and listen to him. Uh, so um, so uh, he started uh, to, he was inspired by the revival stories that he was hearing from different places, from the US, from England, from Wales. Uh, he was reading about these revival stories and then he started to read them to his church. So in January, of 1742, he started reading these stories to his church. And in June of 1740, uh, July of 1742, um, by that time, they had started uh, meeting for prayer daily. Uh, and this prayer movement started to grow. It started to become an all night prayer, started to spread into different parts of Scotland. Um, and uh, at this time, George uh, Whitefield, who we know from the First Great Awakening, right? he came to Scotland and preached. So in July 1742, he preached to about uh, 20,000 people uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, within a month, the next month he came, there were 10,000 people added to that group of people who came to hear him preach. So there's 30,000 people gathered. And he said of this meeting, uh, such a thing I have never witnessed before. The power of God was present from one end of the crowd to the other, like lightning flashing across. You could see thousands bathed in tears, some wringing their hands, others almost swooning, and others crying out and mourning over a crucified Savior. Uh, so this was the work of that prayer, right? To bring people to a place of um, repentance, a, a place where they were desiring to come and hear George Whitefield preach, and then were responding uh, like with conviction to what he was saying. Uh, so this is seen as a fruit of the prayers that had started through the beginning of that year. Um, and then in 1744, uh, this became a prayer model that started to be replicated across Scotland, uh, praying for revival in the church and the extension of God's kingdom on earth. Then 1742, uh, which is that same year when um, George Whitefield visited Scotland, uh, there was a missionary named David Brynard who went to North America so from England, he went to North America as a missionary to the Native Americans. Um, he was an orphan, uh, so he, his parents died when he was 14 years old. Uh, but he was still able to go and get an education uh, at Yale University, but was expelled from the university because of some things he said that the professors were not uh, very happy about. Uh, and from there, he started to prepare to be a minister. Uh, he worked with the Native Americans in New York and Pennsylvania. So that's again along that East Coast that we were looking at yesterday, um, where the English colonies were, right, in North America. So he was working with them, but he didn't, um, he didn't have a lot of success while he was working there. Uh, he then later on, about three years later, moved to another place called Trenton, New Jersey. And there is where he saw a lot of success, a lot of people responding to the faith. He was able to uh, actually establish a community of believers there, build a church, build a school, um, build a medical um, kind of um, or a clinic to help people who were sick. Uh, doing that kind of work, uh, but he lived a very short life. He died at the age of 29. Uh, he was generally quite sick anyway. So by 29, he had tuberculosis and um, he died from that. And Jonathan Edwards, 
was taking care of him during his last days. Um, but after he died, his personal diary was uh, published by Jonathan Edwards. And what he wrote in his personal diary influenced other missionaries like William Carey, Henry Martin, Jim Elliot. So um, that's the powerful thing about these revivals, these missionaries, is that it was God moving through them, um, but their stories then also sparked uh, revival in other places. Uh, so that was, um, even though he lived such a short life, he had such a great impact uh, in those 29 years, but also past the 29 years through his life story. Uh, we next move to the second great awakening, uh, which was from 1780 to 1810. Uh, now this awakening, unlike the first one, the first one happened in North America, the second great awakening uh, started in England and from England it spread to North America, to South Africa, to Europe and to other parts of the world. Um, so this happened at the time of the Enlightenment. Now enlight the Enlightenment was a time when reason was being elevated to uh, say that uh, reason is everything. If you can reason something out, then uh, then you can believe it. If you can't reason it out, then it's not worth believing. Uh, so science, philosophy, all of those things had become very big uh, among people. And so at the same time, people started to abandon um, the Christian faith. Uh, they were opting more for deism or atheism. Uh, so deism is where you believe in a God, but you don't necessarily believe in in Jesus. You just believe that there is a God. Uh, so a lot of the thinkers of that time were would fall in that category. Uh, and then a lot of people were also starting to become atheists at the time. Uh, so also uh, there was morally, financially, spiritually, there was decay in society at that time. And so as a response, the church began to pray every uh, Monday evening they would meet and pray for revival. Um, that started about 17, uh, I think, it started about 1778, I think, where they started that every Monday prayer. And then in 1780, the churches started to pray together. So they uh, decided to pray in unity, uh, like instead of praying separately, to pray together uh, with all the churches. At the same time, there was someone named Robert Rakes who started uh, something called the Sunday School Movement. So uh, his story was, yes, yeah, Children's Church. So uh, he was out on a Sunday morning and he saw uh, some children who were fighting with each other and they had gotten into some kind of uh, brawl with each other. And they were children who were much poorer, children who, um, were kind of like like what we would call rowdies in our uh, like people we see outside, right? So they were from very poor backgrounds, not very educated. Uh, and he went to try and stop them, and they uh, they got upset with him, but he was able to stop the fight and send them away. And then while he was there, he talked to somebody who was around and asked them like, who are these children? Where are they from? Um, and she told them that most of them were. Uh, their parents were either in prison or uh, had died. Uh, and so they worked for their own living. So they worked uh, from Monday to Saturday, and Sunday was their only day off. So Sundays, they didn't have anything to do with themselves, which is why they would get into these kinds of fights. They uh, were just like wasting their time. They were sitting around doing nothing. And so um, Robert Rake's dad had just passed away a few years ago, and he'd always felt this burden of making his father proud. And this was something that burned in his heart when he saw these kids. Uh, and he started to then um, start the Sunday school movement, which was one, to educate these children. So because they were working Monday to Saturday, they weren't going to school. Sunday was the only day they could get an education. So Sundays, they would go and they would study math, English, all of those things, but they would also learn to read and they would also learn the Bible. Um, and it was through this movement that uh, 
the society itself changed because uh, these children were being impacted by what they were reading. Uh, their families were being impacted by what they were learning. Uh, and the Sunday school movement then started to spread uh, across England and from England into America, uh, impacting mostly the poor people um, and um, educating them, educating them in scripture. Uh, so seven years of that praying together, which started in seven, uh, 1780, uh, led to revival in England. And um, through this revival, there were many new churches that were established. Uh, membership in the churches multiplied, it doubled, it even tripled in some cases. Uh, and thousands of missionaries were sent out of England into other parts of the world. Uh, so some missionaries that were sent out during this time, William Carey uh, when, came to India during this time. Uh, William Wilberforce was actually converted during the Second Great Awakening, and he became someone who fought against slave trade. Uh, so he had a huge impact. Um, and through the Sunday School movement, what also happened was there was this focus on teaching the Bible. And so that's what kept the... Uh, church going strong through the revival because the Bible was being taught to uh, not only the children but also to the people as well. Um, so from England we move to North America. Okay, so this uh, North America at this time had split from Europe. They'd fought for their independence and uh, through the American Revolution. And so now they were uh, split from England. Yet England still had an impact because they were still sending people back and forth. So the revival uh, spread from England into North America. Um, at that time, see, uh, there was another wave of moral decline. So we saw in the first Great Awakening uh, that people had been going away from the faith because of their own like everyday battles that they were facing uh, with settling into the new world, uh, with the wars that they were having with Native Americans within themselves, all of those things. Um, so the church was not able to minister to people at that time. And so there was spiritual decline within the church. There were people leaving the church. Uh, we see the same thing happening here around the Second Great Awakening, where there was moral decline in North America as a whole. Uh, but that prayer uh, in churches that was happening in England spread into America, and they started having these things called the concerts of prayer, uh, which, um, if you remember, we were reading about that, um, where people were meeting I can't remember who it was, but the concerts of prayer movement that happened um, in Scotland, right? There were people who were praying and was called concerts of prayer. So from there, this was that that pastor who was a really bad preacher. Uh, he had started those concerts of prayer. So the same kind of thing had started in England and now had spread to uh, North America. So they started to meet in prayer and soon saw revival. Uh, break out um, around America. So from the coast to the inlands, uh, everywhere there was revival breaking out. And uh, revival was breaking out on college campuses. So in Yale University, about one third of the student body uh, was professing faith in Christ. Uh, so a big change from that uh, age of enlightenment, right? So in these universities, there was a big push to think, to use your mind, to reason out everything. And uh, to see the Bible breaking out in the universities itself was powerful. So from Yale, uh, there were several other universities as well who saw um, revival break out on campus among college students. And from the campuses, it then spread into the cities and towns in which these campuses were. Uh, and Churches were growing rapidly. Uh, within three years, the Baptist church added about 10,000 members. In the Methodist church, there were 40,000 members added uh, just within three years. And other denominations as well grew rapidly during this time. 
Uh, we also see during this time that several missionary societies were established. So these uh, missionary societies were established by um, by denominations or were just established as separate institutions and they would raise funds for the work that they were doing they would send out missionaries raise up missionaries and uh, then send them out to different countries so in 1795 we see the london missionary society uh, 1796 the scottish and glasgow missionary society uh, 1797, the Netherlands Missionary Society. Um, 1799, the Christian Missionary Society in London. The Church Missionary Society in London. Uh, so all of these uh, societies were increasing missions to other countries. Um, and through this uh, Church Missionary Society, uh, their main goals were abolition of slave trade, uh, seeing social reformation in England and to evangelize the world. So uh, we see even the members, the founders of these, this society, specifically uh, the Church Missionary Society, were parliament members. So Henry Thornton and William Wilberforce, who were part of parliament, were also part of this movement of sending missionaries out. Um, so what we were talking about in when we're talking about revival, right, we see that uh, government is affected. We see that um, people in society are affected. Um, we see that there is a spread of it, that revival sparks revival in other places. Uh, we see that churches are growing. We see that uh, there is a greater move of the Holy Spirit. We see um, that whatever is being done is great evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's not uh, people's effort that is bearing fruit, right? To see so many people being added to the church, to see people responding to the gospel uh, with such great conviction, all of those things were just moves of the Holy Spirit. And what we say is evidence of a revival. Um, so we'll continue from there. I haven't put the rest on uh, PowerPoint, so I'll just... Um, refer to my notes and we'll continue. Um, so with that, we finish the second Great Awakening and we go into the 19th century, which is the 1800s. Uh, again, we see at the beginning of the 1800s, uh, the British and Foreign Bible Society formed uh, so to translate the Bible into other languages. Uh, 1806, uh, Henry Martin, a uh, missionary to India and Persia, uh, was sent from England to uh, Calcutta in 1806. Um, and his, he had such a great passion for God. He said, let me burn out for God. So uh, I'll, um, my life is just like a flame and let it fully burn out for God. Um, he, in addition to preaching and taking the gospel, he also uh, did a lot of work with languages. So he translated the New Testament into Urdu and uh, Persian, the Psalms into Persian, uh, the Book of Common Prayer into Urdu. The Book of Common Prayer was a book used in the Anglican Church uh, that had a whole list of prayers that were used in the church. So he he translated that into Urdu. Uh, his New Testament translation was the first uh, translation into Persian since the fifth century. So uh, so many hundreds of years later, someone had gone back and translated uh, the scriptures into their language. Um, in 1811, he left from India and moved to Persia. Um, and he had tuberculosis, so from Persia he left and went back to England. Uh, but he died on the way back to England. Um, although it was just six years of doing missions work, uh, he left a legacy of courage, of selflessness, and love for God, uh, both in India and in Persia. Um, and in 1809, uh, we have a missionary who, was, who went to China named Robert Morrison. 
uh, he again was an English missionary sent from the London Missionary Society. Um, so he uh, had studied medicine, astronomy, and Chinese. And he set sail uh, to go to China in January of 1807. Uh, and Two years later, so February 1809, he became the official translator for the East India Company in China. Um, he, so he was working with them, but he was also doing missionary work on the other side. Uh, in 1813, he finished a translation of the New Testament into Chinese, uh, which was published the next year. Uh, he founded the Anglo-Chinese College in 1818, um, and he completed the translation of the Bible into Chinese in 1819, along with his colleague William Milne. Uh, he also compiled three uh, dictionaries, uh, a three-volume dictionary of Chinese to English, uh, and um, he wrote a lot on Chinese grammar, uh, translated hymns and prayer books into Chinese. So this was all very important work because uh, they he was giving access to the local people, to scriptures, to uh, church tradition, to songs, all of these things in a language that they understood so that even if he was no longer there, they had that content, which was going to be really powerful for when uh, China sent all the missionaries out, right? When China became a closed country, uh, what they would be left with is all the work that these missionaries had uh, done for them. Uh, so the scriptures, the um, the writing, all of those things in their own language. Uh, in 1810, the American Board of uh, Commissioners of Foreign Missions, so uh, another um, board that was sending out missionaries, uh, was formed in 1810. In 1812, uh, Adoniram and Anne Judson uh, came as missionaries to India and Burma, so primarily Burma, and uh, they also served in India. Uh, so they were sent from, um, from an American uh, missionary board to Calcutta in India in 1812. Uh, they were Baptists, and they were baptized by William Carey. Uh, but they eventually left uh, that board in the US that had sent them, and uh, they became part of the Baptist Missionary Society. Uh, because of the British Indian, East Indian Company, right? Uh, like uh, Francis talked about how there was. Um, there were the the East India Company didn't like William Carey being around because he was doing missions work. They were there for their own goals of uh, of monetary benefit. Uh, similarly, the East India Company didn't like these missionaries who had come in, and so they forced them to leave, and uh, they left India and went into Burma um, and began work there. Um, in 1826, Anne Judson died because of sm smallpox. Um, in 1842, her husband continued his work. He created uh, English Burmese Dictionary. Um, uh, but eventually, in 1850, he died of a fever uh, when he was traveling back to, um, to get some medical help. He died on the way. Um, so something that he wrote, he said, all that has been done in Burma has been done by the churches through the feeble and unworthy instrumentality of myself and my brethren. Uh, and his wife said, direct me in thy service and I ask no more. Uh, so what they did was uh, out of full commitment to God. Uh, like when we read these stories, there is such great evidence of sacrifice. They were not choosing the comforts of staying in their countries. Uh, they were going to countries that were uh, would present to them a lot of hardship, right? So we read about all of these people dying uh, because of sickness, because they were facing so much hardship uh, financially, medically. Um, and there was no support even from their own people, even though those people were from government the government wasn't really supportive of missionary work that was happening in a lot of these places. Uh, so 
it involved a lot of sacrifice, a lot of obedience to God, uh, just and uh, a great, great passion for uh, reaching people. Um, it was just a full commitment. When we read uh, all of the things they say, it's like, let me do this fully, like give myself fully, no matter what it takes, to the work that God has called me to. Um, so, yeah, 1814, the American Baptist Missionary Union was formed. 1816, the American Bible Society was formed, again, for translating the scripture into different languages. Um, then in 1816, the American Sunday School Union was formed. So this was uh, from England. It had passed into the United States. And so in the United States, they founded their own organization to oversee the work that was being done. Uh, so the Sunday School movement um, also it became a very established movement where uh, teachers were being trained, curriculum was being created. Uh, all of that uh, was being done. So what started just as somebody doing that uh, for a few children in their town uh, started to become a much more organized effort. And um, from meeting in people's houses initially to then meeting in churches um, and having people overseeing the work that was being done. Uh, in 1816, uh, we uh, read about Robert Moffat. So he's known as the father of Protestant African missions. Um, he was a Scottish minister, um, missionary, and he went to Africa um, to teach about Christ. He translated the whole Bible and the Pilgrim's Progress into uh, Setswana, which was the language there. Uh, and he was the father-in-law to Dr. David Livingstone, so was the missionary. The Pilgrim's Progress is a Christian classic. Uh, you've read it? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, the original is also written in Old English, so it's difficult to read. But it's uh, basically a story of the Christ like a Christian, of someone who becomes a Christian, and their journey to uh, in faith. Uh, yeah, it is like it's basically taking one person's story and talking about what the Christian journey is like. How do you stay faithful to God through everything? Uh, all the way till eternity. So it's a very nice story. Um, yeah, we'll do a little more and then we can stop for comments, questions. Uh, I think Sean is presenting next week. Is it? Uh, Sean, your uh, presentation is on 25th, right? Yeah, yesterday we looked at it. He's not presenting today. It's next week. Yeah. 25th, you're right. Oh, OK. So we'll continue for a few more minutes. And then uh, if anyone wants to share any thoughts, questions, we can look at that. Um, so 1819. Uh, there was a medical missionary who came to India, Dr. John Scudder. Um, and he was a pioneer in American, uh, he was a pioneer American physicist and evangelist in Sri Lanka and India. So he left uh, New York in 1819, so New York in the US, uh, and came to Sri Lanka as the first medical missionary uh, sent by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Uh, so um, apart from sending missionaries with the gospel, um, medical missions started to become something and that was also being done by these boards. So uh, doctors were being sent, which is really powerful because 
uh, then you could come from any background, right? You could come from a medical background and you could serve in the field of missions, uh, although you were not a trained pastor or preacher uh, and all of that. And also they were serving in countries that didn't have a lot of medical uh, work happening already. So they were able to, in that way, also impact uh, the health um, sphere of these countries. So uh, along with, uh, with the medical work, he was also uh, engaging in evangelism in the hospital, in the boarding schools that they had, in, and also training medical students um, in Jaffna. So in 1836, he was transferred to Madras for six years. And uh, after a four-year break, uh, he took a four-year break in the US, came back to India, served in Madras and Madurai till 1855 when he died, um, uh, when he was in Africa. So he went to South Africa and he died there. Um, so he published many tracts in Tamil and English. Uh, he would stand for 11 hours at a time, preaching, distributing um, Christian literature. Um, and four generations, that's about 42 missionaries, uh, including Ida Skada, came from his family. Uh, so they contributed to uh, well over 1,000 years of missionary service um, in India. Um, 1830 to 1840 is the third Great Awakening. So um, the second Great Awakening that started in America uh, continued after that. So the well, what had happened at that time just continued. Uh, even though there was uh, the war that happened in America, 1812 to 1815, the Second Great Awakening, all that was happening in the church continued in power. It was not affected by the war. Um, Charles Finney, who was a lawyer in New York, uh, came to faith in 1821 and then started to... Um, started to become, a, he was a preacher after that. Uh, in 1830, uh, he had, um, like he went out sharing the gospel in New York and there were many people who responded to him at that time, responded to his preaching, many people who were saved um, uh, during that time. So this is part of the third uh, great revival. In, it's estimated that in one year, that is in 1830, about 100,000 people got added to the church just in that one year during this uh, revival. Uh, similarly, there was revival taking part in other places in Great Britain. Uh, the Methodist Church experienced revival. Um, James Corgi, uh, who was also from the uh, from America, uh, so it was during this time that he uh, he preached, and William Booth, who founded um, the Salvation Army, he came to Christ. Um, at the same time, in Wales, so uh, Wales in Scotland, all of these places in Ireland, uh, revival was spreading in other parts of Europe. Um, the Christian Brethren denomination uh, that uh, was formed was formed during this time. Uh, so a lot of this revival fire was spreading through a lot of Europe as well, Switzerland, France, Holland, Norway, Germany. Uh, and the revival was sparking revivals in new places, in other places. Um, there was revival in Hawaii, in Australia, in Polynesian kingdoms, in uh, South Africa, in Botswana, in the Middle East, China, Burma. So this was like a really uh, global uh, I think compared to the first Great Awakening, which was only in North America, Second Great Awakening was mostly in Europe uh, and in North America. And this time it spread all over the globe. Um, so we'll um, read more about that or we'll talk more about it next week. Um, anyone has anything to share? I think we can close for now. Anything to share? Any questions? No. OK, so next week, I think we have quite a few people presenting, uh, both on 25th and 26th. 
Uh, so all of you who are presenting, uh, please uh, be prepared. And also, if you all can keep it to that time limit, it will really be helpful for us to be able to cover um, all the presentations and continue, if possible, with the content as well. Let me just take a look. I think 25th. We have. 25th, I think, is just two people or something. 26th has a lot of people. Yeah, we have five people on 26th. Uh, OK, and I think just Sean on 25th. OK, so 25th, we'll do Sean's presentation. We'll try to cover a lot of our content. 26th, we'll just do all the presentations. Um, and then if we have extra time, we'll also do a little bit of our content. OK, we'll close a little early today. Uh, have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you all next week. <laughs>